Right, so we are going to start punctually, right, so that we can proceed at a reasonable pace. Uh, discipline, always go for your toilet breaks before the lesson, and right, this should be applied for all your lessons. Uh, no unnecessary talking, but if you want to discuss about the physics, please go ahead. Right? Uh, and you have to engage your brain and ask questions. Okay, I've, I've uh, spent effort to craft this lecture notes and slides to the best of my ability. Uh, so I would appreciate it if you will give me feedback on what I can improve further or what uh, does not, it's not clear enough, right? So I can help you and also the next lectures. Right, so first, right, uh, it's an introduction. It's to link between electromagnetic induction and AC, right? The picture went up for some reason. Right, so I'm going to show you this. Um, electromagnetic induction, you have here a magnet, right, and a coil that's spinning around it. We know that creates an EMF. And if that is connected through a resistor, you will get a variable voltage and hence a variable current. Okay, can you see that it's turning this blue dot that's going up and down? Right? That is essentially your variable EMF, your alternating EMF. And hence, we will create an alternating current, which is a pumping quantity. Okay? So, uh, we lovingly call this chapter AC, right? But it includes alternating voltages and all the things and the applications regarding it. This is an interesting chapter because I'm presenting to you this Mustafi guy. Anyone of you knows who this man is? Yes, yeah, he has a company named after him. A company by Elon Musk, the car Tesla, right? This guy is Nikola Tesla, right? He is in fact the inventor of the concept of AC, right? Back in the 1800s, right? A little bit about him. Um, he not just did AC; he invented radio. Oh well, well, he did radio. He did radar. He did X-rays. He built the first hydroelectric plant. He patented transistors 100 years before they were developed. First person to record radio waves from outer space. Created ball lightning 100 years before modern scientists. He's too early for his time. He created neon lighting. He created neural control. He created a modern electric motor. He created wireless communication. He spoke in languages. Remembered everything he read. <laughs> so today, or rather this topic, we are doing just a very, very small part of what he is, what he has done. Okay? And it doesn't fail, right? every time I present this whole list of achievement, I get silence for all these points, and I then, the moment I show the last two, everyone's like, wow. Right? Uh, but I assure you that the first few points that he has done, he has the first for many of this, Right, and it's a much more difficult thing to do to achieve and to do this. Okay, so and a lesson in life, right? Uh, there are three kinds of geniuses in the world. The first kind is the kind that call themselves geniuses. The second kind, right, uh, is people call them geniuses, and the third kind is geniuses calling them genius. So I calling him a genius. <laughs> So he belongs to the third kind. Okay? So yeah, not humble, not humble at all. Don't learn this one, but this guy is a, a true, true genius. So today we are standing on the shoulders of such genius, right? So pay attention, sit up and listen, okay? And it's not an easy life. It's not just because you're smart, your life is going to be easy. In the next chapter, uh, next lecture, I'm going to show you actually how difficult it was for him to prove his science in face of the odds, right? So let's jump in. Um, there are a few learning outcomes given to you by MOE, and I've roughly categorized them into three parts, right? Um, 
So the first one will be introduction, right? What is the difference between DC and AC? And the terms and the waveform. These, these are the things that I'll go through very quickly. Essentially, uh, DC, direct current, does not necessarily mean a uniform current. It does not mean that. It just means that the current flows in one direction. Okay? Current flows in one direction. That is DC. It can vary, but as long as it doesn't change direction, it is DC. So AC is essentially the opposite of that. Anything that changes direction is AC, but in our subject, we generally focus on those that have a repeating waveform. Okay, you have a repeating waveform. That means it's sinusoidal in nature. So this is what we call a sinusoidal waveform. We have a square waveform and we have a triangular waveform. The first two appears a little bit more commonly. Right? If, if I give you a percentage, the first one appears about 80% of the time. Uh, the second one appears about 20% of the time. Okay? All right, so the key point is it will change direction right, and you will do it periodically, meaning that there's a constant period. Right, so uh, these are the basics, right? To teach you the basics, I must make sure you all know how to name them. And so many of these are similar to what you learned in the chapter of waves. So the key skill here is that if I give you an equation, you must be able to draw for me the wave. And converse is also true. If I give you the wave, you must be able to give me the equation. Okay, meaning if I put the P here, the period as 10 seconds, can you tell me what is the omega? The omega must be 2 pi over 10, right, and sub it. If I tell you that the frequency is 5 hertz, that means it repeats 5 times in a second, can you tell me what is the equation? You must put here 2 pi times 5, that means 10 pi for your omega. Right, that is the first key skill that you must have. Okay? Next, there are a few other terms that I need to introduce. Peak-to-peak uh, -peak current, that's basically what it is. The arrow shows it very clearly. Right? And to give you a sense of what AC is, um, I previously done this a long time ago. Watch. Okay? I spent a lot of time doing this. I'm just going to show you. But it's very useless now. Okay? AC, current increase, current can pick up, goes to peak, reserve a set of arrows. But with modern technology, this has been outdated, so I'm just going to show you what people have done now, which is quite sad for me. Basically, it's like that. Ta -da. So much better. Right? It shows you that the voltage and the current are actually in phase, and it goes up and down. Okay? And this actually shows you that it's from a circle. If you move on the edge of a circle, it becomes a wave. Right? You have learned that it's circular motion and in oscillations. Okay? Yep, you see that. Just to show you that AC moves up and down and you know, cyclical like magnets. Okay, sorry, I'm wasting time. Done. Hmm? Right, other terms in an AC uh, period, obvious. Frequency is 1 over period. Angular frequency. Omega, angular frequency. Some students write for me angular velocity. That's not correct. Right? Angular velocity belongs only to <laughs> circular motion. Right? From simple harmonic motion, SHM onwards, we are talking about angular frequency already. So please express this correctly. Okay? Peak current, I naught, very important. Right, one of the key things that you must know, the peak value of a current is called the peak current. And you have the peak to peak current. Uh -huh. I feel like uh, it's like primary school teacher, huh? but it's okay. Right, so first example, right, the most important, if you are revising this, if you are listening to this video, the most important of this example is to understand part A. B, C, D is just for you to learn, right? So part A, how do you express the AC? So can you cover up the solution? 
and try to figure out what is Come up your, your the solution with your non muscle hand and using your muscle hand. Can you just roughly sketch your answer for what this wave should be? Using what we have learned previously. Right, on, the, on page 3, you have the general equation. Page 4, I want you to put in the equation for part A. Okay, this should take a lot of minute. Try. Right, so you have look at the the wave, right, and you can see that the period is 0 0.01 seconds, which means that you can sub it in to find the angular frequency to be 100 pi, which means you can sub it into the equation, and you know that the peak value is 1.2 amperes. So the general equation of i equals to i naught sine omega t on page three becomes i equals to 1.2 sine 100 pi t. Okay, this is the most difficult already. I mean, this for, for this example is the hardest part of all. Of it. The rest, part B, C, D, is just plugging in numbers, which I believe you all can do very well. Okay. But the point of BCD is not just for you to plug in numbers. It's for you to realize that the power value varies with the current. And if you look at part D, even when the current is negative, right? Even when the current is negative, the power becomes a positive value. So for your AC current, your power will vary between 0 to a certain maximum value. Okay? That is essentially what I want you to get out of from example 1, is that your power varies from 0 to a certain value. Your power can never be negative. This then begs a question, right? In your direct current, in your direct current, it is very easy to determine the power of a circuit. Do you agree? Right, because the current is fixed, usually the resistance is fixed, I squared R, you get the answer. Okay, so this brings us to part, the second part of the lecture, which is all this. Right? I'm going to introduce you to this new thing. It's called the mean square current. Actually, it's not that new because you have learned about root mean square speed in temperatures. It's the same idea, but we're going to use the same concept, apply it to the idea of current. So mean square current looks a bit weird, uh, but it's that these triangles usually mean mean, and the square is the square. So let's talk about it. So. For DC circuits, right, we generally have it easier, right, to find the power. It's just I squared R. But following example one, we see that power varies. Then how do you then decide what is the power? Why is that an important thing, right? Because if you use the wrong AC, and you submit to a resistor, you're bloating some, you're overheat something, or you're underheat something. Imagine that heater was used in the Arctic. Right? You're, you're an engineer designing the heating system for researchers analyzing snow in the Arctic. Right? Or polar bears in the Arctic. Or Antarctic. Whichever it is. And you design the heating power wrongly, your researchers are either going to boil or they're going to freeze to death, right? So it essentially can be a matter of life and death. So the question is, since there's a variable power, how then do we decide how much power uh, AC current gives, right? So this is the question I want you to have when I continue through this next part. Okay, so for DC, it's easy, but for AC, it varies like this, right? It keeps changing, it keeps changing, right? And you realize that even when the current goes back to zero, and changes direction, the power still comes up, right? Mm -hmm. I did a lot of 
You see all those arrows, right? These animations took impossibly long to do, but now they are all not very worth it. Anyway, moving on. Um, we see in example one that there were instantaneous power at various points in time. Right? And that is what we also saw in the short animation that I showed you. As the current increase, power increase. Okay. So back to the question, how do we then de define or find the average power? So, the best way to approach this problem is to find averages, right? Um, as with many things in life, it doesn't make sense to tell you one... Uh, it makes sense to give you a... to tell you very quickly what the thing is about, or give you a sense of things by telling you what the average is. Right? So power is the way that we are approaching for this. So if you look at this, average power, P equals I squared R, so you must average of I squared R. Correct? However, because resistance is fixed, we can take R out of the picture, so we have P equals to bracket I squared, close bracket R. And this, this is actually called the mean square curve. Okay. Same for same for voltage, the mean square curve. Okay. So I want you to watch again uh, where my pointer is. I'm teaching you about the mean square current and it reads from the outside in mean square current. Okay, follow me. Right? Important point to note because later on you will be you will see that why that is important. Huh? So mean square current. Why is it important? Because, because for an AC, the mean current is zero. If you take the square mean current, you will always get zero. Meaning, if you take the bracket first over I, and then you put a square over the bracket, that value will always be zero if it's a sinusoidal current, right? And if you then take power of the square mean current, your power will be zero, which cannot be, because we know that we send an AC through a resistor, there will always be heat being produced. Okay? So this is the first reason why we need to introduce concepts such as the mean square. Okay, at this point, I will pause. Any questions? Okay, good. No questions, then I will move on. Questions? Yes? Is this pace too fast? Too slow? Okay, nobody's nodding for too slow, so that seems to be fine. So I've introduced to you the mean square current. I now want to introduce to you the root mean square current. And like, so why do you need to introduce one more thing? Because the mean square current has units of A square. Right? When we compare a DC to an AC, we want to compare current with current. We want to compare apple with apple. We cannot compare current with current square. If you are a supercomputer, you can process that, but you are a normal human being, most of you. Maybe some of you are superhuman, just that you are hiding in okay, mind. But the point is, it is easy for us to compare a number with a number of the same units. That's the whole point. All right. So after I've introduced to you mean square current, I need to root it. So that gives me the root mean square current. Okay. But before I get to that, let me talk to you about this scary looking uh, mathematical symbol, which is called the integral. The mean square current is essentially the integral 
of i square over time. And if you are looking for the mean square current between time t2 and t1, you have to add t2 and t1 as the boundaries and divide out by the whole uh, the whole length of time, which is t2 by t1. But essentially, essentially, what this means is that the i square over time is the area under the i square time graph. Okay, essentially, it's the area under i square time graph. That one, I maybe you should add it to your books so that you can make your reading easier. Do you need to know how to use the integral sign? Don't need. But do you need to know that it's the area under the I-square time graph? Yes. Do you need to apply it? Yes. Right, there were questions uh, in A-levels and prelims that use this concept. Okay. So, once we have that, uh, mean square current, we can root it and we get a root mean square current. And I'm going to show you, right, just now I show you mean square and I'm going to show you root mean square. Root mean square. Okay, this is how you say it, but when you apply it mathematically, one more time for you who are not looking at the screen, one more time, root mean square, but do you realize that if you were to apply this mathematically, what are you actually doing? We are actually doing the square, the mean, and then rooting it. Okay? So although I say it's the root mean square, you know that mathematically you are actually doing the square first, then the mean, then the root. Okay? okay? Right. So how does this apply to average power? How does this solve our problem? So power is I square R, or rather mean square current arc times r. This allows me to then create the root mean square current by square rooting it. So that then I can, once I have the root mean square current, I can compare this value to a DC. Very clearly I know okay, whether this power of a root mean square current will give me a power larger than or smaller than a DC. Okay? So this is why we are doing all this. Okay? And this is how we are doing it. This then also allows us to create or write down a few more equations. If power equals to i square r or root mean square current squared times r, it will also be equals to the root mean square voltage times the root mean square current. And it will also be equals to the root mean square voltage divided by resistance. So basically it's the same as your i square r equations, your power equations, just that Instead of I and V, you now include the value I RMS, V RMS. Okay? So nothing new until now. Okay? And this brings me to the most important point on page 6, which is the definition of the root mean square current. We see from what I've just said that the power of the root mean square current squared times r will give you an average power. And using the average power, we can say that if we then replace the AC of root mean square current 10 amperes by a DC of current 10 amperes, the powers will be the same. Right? Let us sink in for a little bit. If I take a RMS value current of 10, I send it through a resistor, I'll get a certain amount of power. I can replace that by a DC, I'll get the same amount of power. That's essentially what we have done in the mathematics until now. And then that allows me to then define the Ruby square value, which is this. The Ruby square value of an AC is the value of the DC that will produce thermal energy at the same rate in the resistor. Okay, um, the definition, I want you to now take 30 seconds, one minute, I'll give you one minute, okay? 
Look at it. Cover up. Repeat. Ready? Go. Okay, right? So what have I said to you now? I said so much things, right? Summarize, huh? I explained to you why we need to introduce Ruby Square Current. And I also explained, no, then I said, I told you that the Ruby Square Current is the value that if you use to use a DC of the same value of the Ruby square current and you put it in a circuit, you will produce the same heat as the Ruby square current. So those are the two things that I've told you until now. In the next few pages, I will prove to you. Okay, I'll prove to you that that is essentially the case. Okay. So which is, and I'm going to use two specific. Patterns to show you one for square waves, which appears about 20% of the time in questions, and then the more importantly, the sinusoidal is which is the, the key uh, for today's lesson. Okay, so let's start with example two. Now I'm going to compare with you a square wave that goes between two to negative two periodically and a DC of two. Okay, calculate the power in a DC 2.0 ampere. That's easy. I square R, I get 20 watts. How do you then do it for part B, which is the power in a square wave? So, we see there's a, there's a fast way about it, and let's go by the fast way first, which is that because it goes with it up and down, we know that it, when you square the negative 2, you also get the value of 4. Right? Regardless it's positive or negative, when you square it, you always get the value of 4. 4 times 5 always gives you 20. Right? But, I want to slow it down, I want to break it down for you. What you are essentially doing is you are squaring the wave. Can you see? What you are essentially doing in the second case of part B is that you are squaring the wave. And because the I squares are the same, then you get the same power. Okay? Part 3. Example 3. We now give you a weirder looking uh, alternating current. And I and the graph that I give you is a general graph. I then give you the values in part B. Okay, so part A is the harder part. You are now asked to give the root mean square current in terms of I1 and I2. You have a register, and through it, you send this alternating current, and you're asked to find the Ruby square current in terms of I1 and I2. Then you have part B, C, D. I'm oh, sorry, part A is mean square current, so my my fault. Uh, mean square current. And it's only later on that you find root mean square current. So, to find the mean square current, what must you do first? What, what must you do first? Do you mean 
then square or do you square then mean mathematically you must square and take the mean okay so when you square it between time you see that the, the graph rotates periodically between but well, can break it into two parts, right? The period is zero to t, but you see that zero to three quarter t is a certain value, and three quarter t to big t is another value. So you can actually break it down into two parts. Right? So in the first part, the current is i one squared. The second part, the current is i two squared. The mean is then three quarter of the i one squared value plus one quarter of the i two squared value. And done. Alright, so graphically, what is happening? Graphically, this is happening. Huh? I1, I2, you square it. Then the mean is essentially finding the line where the areas are the same. You to find the line or the value of the line where the areas on top are equal to the area below. This is essentially what you are doing. I know in mathematics you're doing, oh, let's take the mean. If I give you two numbers, three and five, the mean is four. But what essentially you are doing is that you're taking five times one because it occurs once, three times one is the area, and you're finding that it's actually, and you take eight, then you divide back by two because you have two occurrences to find the average value. So essentially you're taking an area, you're doing an area problem. Okay. So if I I know at this point right, I mean uh, some of you are like I don't understand. So let's look at one more. How do you find the mean number of apples? If I give you ten apples on the first day, five apples on the second day, and zero apples on the third day, and I repeat that every three days, what is the mean number of apples I give you per day? Five, right? Because, and you do it very simply because you take 10 plus 5 plus 0, you get 15, and that's every 3 days you divide by the total time is 3, so 15 divided by 3 is 5. But essentially, what you're doing, you're doing the, the area problem, right? You're taking, uh, you're finding the line here, where the area here. Can come in here and fit perfectly like Tetris. Right? Let's try a harder problem. What's the mean number of apples? You have 10 on the first day, 2 on the second day, sorry, 10 on the first day, 8 on the second day, um, 5 on the third and fourth day, 2 on the fifth day, and then 0 on the sixth day. What's the mean? Number of apples per day. The answer is five because in the countries, right, there's this shape that you fit in here. You will actually score a high score. Do not forget about the day where it's zero. Okay, some of you will make the mistake of not including the day where it's zero. So you must take 10 plus 8 plus 5 plus 5 plus 2 plus 0 and divide by 6. Okay, that's how you take the mean. Alright, so we come back. And the mean. Part B. What is then the average power if you are given r equals to 5, i1 equals to 4, i2 equals to 2? Well, sub in, you get answer 65 watts. Part C, part B is the easy one. Part C, what is then the root mean square current? This is new to you. How would you do it? The root mean square current, you have to square it first. You have to mean it, then you have to root it. Right? So we know 
since we already know the mean square current is given by this value, this bracket of 3 quarter i1 square plus 1 quarter i2 square, all we have to do is to root that and we get the root mean square current. And at this point, if you have a calculator or you have a supercomputer between your ears, you can just take 3.6 square and multiply by 5, you should see that the value is 65, which is the answer in part B. Okay. So one more time. Pictorially, how it's done? You square it, you mean it to find the value of the i square value, and then you root, square root that, that value back here. Okay, and that value, this green line is 3.6 amperes. That's essentially what we have done. Do you want to see the animations again? Square it. Mean it. Root it. And find its value. Okay. Why is this important? So I know. Explain again up. Okay. Example three is to show you why this is important. It's because if you just take the average current value, the mean value, you will get something around 2.5. If you think that the average value squared times r gives you the power and you will be wrong. You will you will have vastly underestimated the power produced. Okay. So example three is to hit home that the mean current and the root mean square current is not the same. The mean current and the root mean square current is not the same. Okay. Finally, I can talk about the important part, right, which is the sinusoidal AC. For square waves, it is easy to square. Right? You take 2, you square, you get 4. You take 1, you square, you get 1. You get 3, you square, you get 9. But how do you square a sine wave? OMG, right? I'm going to teach you. So i is given by this value. Uh, i is given by this equation. If you square it, you get i naught square sine square omega t, which you can, which before the days of a graphic calculator, this makes a lot of sense because you can sine square becomes one minus cosine two omega t with a half in practice. Right? Those of you who are very good with your mathematics, you can immediately process that sine square omega t is half 1 minus cosine 2 omega t, correct? Yes? Yes, for the lack of knots, yes. Okay, so I'm going to prove to you, if you just say the calculator, you just punch it in, you sketch the graph, uh, that's one thing. I'm going to prove to you that you can actually sketch it from basic principles. So, if I take a cosine curve, I change it from cosine omega t to cosine 2 omega t, the period is doubled. Or rather, the, the period is half, sorry. The frequency is doubled, the period is half. Right? I'm now going to add a negative sign because, right? And I'll get negative 2. I'll flip it around. The x axis, I'll get negative 2 cosine omega t. I'm going to add 1 to it to get the value of the equation of 1 minus cosine 2 omega t. And I'm going to multiply it by i naught and a half. Okay. 
right? Look at this. There you go. Right, your sine square graph looks like this. Okay. So, root mean square current, if you square it, it looks like this. If you then take the mean, you will realize the mean will be at the halfway point of the peak value of the i square graph. Because you can see that the areas fit perfectly. You don't know how long all these animations take. So many late nights <laughs> crying at the computer. And after you mean it, you must root it and get back a value. Okay? So that's how you find the root mean square value of a sine curve through a graph. But numerically, there's a much easier way to do it, which is the box in yellow, which is you take the peak value and divide by square root 2. If you want to know why it's square root 2, you need to follow, revisit this recorded lecture and see how I've done it step by step. But if you just want to apply it, you have to memorize this equation. Right, so this equation, i root mean square current equals to i naught over square root 2, word of caution, is only for a full sinusoidal wave. A full sinusoidal wave. Okay? And once we arrive at this, we can then extrapolate this. Sorry. Wait, what else is this? Mm, yep, that's what I've said. Right? i naught over square root 2, which approximates to 0 0.707 i naught. Anyway, moving on, we can then extrapolate this for voltage and power, right? VRMS is the same concept, and power, interestingly, becomes the peak power divided by 2, which is kind of a nice result because, because in whichever sinusoidal current you are given, you take the peak current, I0. I0, you square it times R, you get the peak power, P0. Right, this is the peak power. And you divide by 2, you immediately get the half, the, the average power. Right, which is the mean power. So this is actually a very, very nice conclusion to get. Okay? Right, let's try example 4. Um, you have a voltage, uh, electrical means at 240 RMS. Do you know, look at the switch over there, uh, our means, the plug. What is our, what is Singapore's power output? It is 240. But is it 240 peak power or 240 root mean square? Sorry. Is it 240 peak voltage or is it 240 root mean square voltage? It is root mean square. Okay, you need to know that. So find the peak voltage available is 340. Calculate the root mean square current for electric cathode with a power rating of 1000. And a power rating. The power rating I give to you, is it the maximum power? Or is it the average power? In the exam question, they don't tell you this kind of thing that you need to know. So when you say, hey, this bulb has a power rating of 40, is it 40 peak value or average? It is average. Right? So 1000 is actually the average power. You can easily get a root mean square current of 4.2. So just divide. Okay? So two things in example four. What is a power rating? And what when I tell you the means is 240 volts, you need to know that that means that it is a root mean square voltage. Number five. 
This is a real life example, uh, number five. Uh, my cousin brought US, the, the electrical supplies, right? Appliances uses 110 volts. So my cousin bought something from the US and he plugged it into our Singaporean mains. Guess what happened? Okay, so uh, in this example, we will see what happens. Okay, so if, if the heater normally consumes 500 watts of power, where is the heating reason, the heating coil? You'll find this value P equals to Vr mass square over R. Right? Notice that I use 500 as the average power. I use 110 as the Vr mass. Right? This is the applications to apply electrical circuits, right? And I get this resistance. Next, if I then put it in the Singapore uh, context of 240, how much power do I actually get? The resistance of the kettle does not change when I bring it from US to Singapore. It does not change. But I've changed the power, the voltage supply. I must have changed the average power given to the kettle. So you see that a kettle that was designed for 1000 watts is now being given 2380 watts. What do you think will happen? There will be smoke. Right? Essentially, that was what happened when my cousin plugged in the device to my house, the whole house tripped, yeah, and there was smoke coming out. Fried circuitry, right? So when you learn physics, you can save money, right? You know that, hey, hello, you cannot plug it in. Okay? Right, so part C, uh, what is the root mean square current? That one is just applying what we learned before. We know that the root mean square voltage 240, the resistance, the root mean square current is 9.9. It's a lot higher than before. Okay? So the next question is then, of course, this uh, in real life, right? You, how many of you have laptops at home or have seen a laptop? If you haven't, this is one. Uh, the power supply we have in Singapore is different, right? Than the one in US, but if you travel, if you look at the people who travel, do they just plug it in directly into the mains and it works? Answer is yes. You don't need a different adapter for a laptop. Because the power adapters are designed to eat either 110 or 240 or anything in between and convert it into the necessary voltage for your laptop. Uh, a bunch of interesting issues. Interested in these kind of things, you are probably an electrical engineer, right? You should further your studies in that direction. Anyway, uh, example six, before I release you, you have another one. A sinusoidal current described by this equation. What is the root mean square current and voltage floating across this resistor? Well, part A is easy. You look at this equation, you know that 9.0 is the peak value. So since it's sinusoidal, you just take that value divided by square root 2. Done. Right? Once you have the root mean square current, you know that V equals IR, you can find the root mean square voltage equally easily. What is then the peak power generated? Just take the peak current square times R, you get the peak power. Part C, what is the average power? Average power is a root mean square current. Right, root mean square current squared times R. You get this. And here you, I want to show you part B and C are actually in a real exam question. They will never ask you like this. But I just want to show you one more time that the average power is half of the maximum value. Lastly, sketch a graph to show the power distributed. And part D is the most important of this page, 11 to the star. How do you sketch 
you know the peak value, you know the zero value, the, the minimum will be zero. And you know that the period is 0 0.02. This is the key. Can you highlight the period can be found through the equation of 100, uh, omega equals 100 pi, and found that the period equals to 0 0.02 seconds. But can you see that one period on the graph has two humps? It goes up once, come down, go up once. Many students, many, many, many students make the mistake of saying, oh, the period is 0 0.02, the value after the first half is 0 0.02, and that is a critical mistake. Can you please write that in? One period for power has two halves. Go up, come down, go up, come down. Key point. And that's it. Okay, that's it. This is what I've done today. I showed you a summary of the equations until now. Okay, I'll show you the missing column when I show you transformers. Alright, thank you. See you next lesson. Bye bye.